I heard a story not long ago about a pastor, and she related that she was seven years old the first time she encountered the rich young man from the story that Alexa read us from the Gospel of Mark. Her uncle had dared her to read the whole Bible all the way through, and so she had taken the bait. She said she started with the Gospels and had gotten this far without reading anything that sounded particularly foreign to her. Most of the stories about Jesus were somewhat familiar from Sunday school lessons and vacation Bible school. But then one night she got to Matthew 19, 24, which is repeated here in the lesson from Mark that we read, 10, 25. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. She said she didn't remember ever having heard this preach, taught, or quoted before. Now, of course, she was seven, so she could have misremembered. But she was a little bit alarmed, so she said she slammed the Bible shut and jumped out of bed and ran down the hall to her parents' room. She shook her mother awake, and she said, Mom, Jesus says that rich people don't go to heaven. Her mother whispered back, We're not rich. Go to bed. <laughs> This pastor, though, even at seven, knew better. She knew that she had everything she needed and a lot of the stuff she wanted. She had seen children on TV who had flies in their eyes and bellies swollen from hunger, and so she was pretty sure that her family was rich. Now she understands that they were a pretty standard middle-class American family, but I think her seven-year-old instincts were also right. When I think about my childhood also, we were probably a little poorer than my friend was. A certain part of my childhood, we were decidedly in a lower class. I remember one point in my life when my mother paid for our groceries with food stamps right after my dad had been discharged from the Navy and before he'd gotten another job. And other times when one of my youngest siblings was very sick and in the hospital and people would bring us groceries and, um, and even school supplies to our house. But I also know those words of Jesus are clear and hard and scary. And I know, and my friend knows, that they were meant for us too. We began last week a sermon series that will take us all the way through Lent as we journey with Christ toward Jerusalem and towards the cross. We're going to spend these weeks doing some very hard learning as we talk about the hard sayings of Jesus. The ones that are confusing and hard to hear sometimes even seem contradictory to Christ's overall message. These are the passages that when we hear them, they make us go, say what? Like our meme that Mike created for us. Last week, we began by talking about a verse where Jesus tells us to hate our parents and our families. And if you missed that sermon, you can find it on our website. And this week, we turn to a passage about money, a passage where Jesus tells us it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Lots of people have spent lots of time trying to soften the meaning of Jesus' words here. Many people have been taught that there's actually a narrow gate in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle through which a camel could not pass unless all of its baggage was first removed. After dark, when the main gates were shut, if a traveler wanted to enter the city, he had to use this smaller gate, which he could do only if he removed all of his belongings from the camel's sides, and then the camel had to enter the gate crawling on its knees. Raise your hand if you've heard that story or heard the scripture interpreted that way. Oh, not as many people as I thought, but a good, bit, a good many. It makes a sweet little story, right? The point of which, presumably, is that if we can just get rid of the belongings that we cling to so harshly, which weigh us down and can humble ourselves, we can approach God. In other words, there is something that we can do ourselves to be saved. Just get rid of your stuff. It's that easy. But here's the thing. Through research, we found that A, the, the interpretation, this interpretation of that passage is actually a relatively new one. For a very long time, that was not the understanding of what this passage meant. And B, there is no biblical evidence to support this claim. No evidence that there was a gate like that called the eye of the needle. There was probably a gate, but it wasn't named the eye of the needle. And really, Jesus' claim is more outrageous than that. His story about the camel through the eye of the needle is meant to be ludicrous hyperbole. Remember last week we talked about that literary device. A hyperbole is a literary term meaning obvious and intentional exaggeration, like I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Jesus uses it here to let us know how ridiculous this man's question is. He's not telling us about something that is merely hard. He is talking about something which is impossible. 
The question at the heart of this story is not about wealth or poverty, about possessions or lack thereof. The question that the man asks is about eternal life. The rich man wants to know how to get it. The disciples want to know who can have it. And the good news that Jesus offers is this. For mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. That's the answer. That's it. For mortals, it is impossible, but for God, all things are possible. So what? That's it? That's all the answer Jesus can give us? Well, we know the truth of that is not really. This story of the rich man coming before Jesus is essentially one of the healing stories that we find. The rich man runs up to Jesus and kneels, just as many, many others in need of healing have done throughout the Gospel of Mark. His running and kneeling shows that his request is both urgent and sincere. But this man has something unique that nobody else does in the healing stories. He is the one person in the entire book who rejects the healing that Jesus offers him. Not long before this particular passage in Mark, we also encounter a discussion between the disciples about who is the greatest. And it's within this context that we have a glimpse of someone who does have greatness according to the world's definitions. The man who comes before Jesus is not a disciple, but he's not an opponent either. He doesn't resemble the scribes or the Pharisees or the Sadducees who test Jesus. He doesn't resemble the soldiers who mock him or the passers-by at the crucifixion who taunt him. He looks like all of the other earnest seekers who have come to Jesus looking for healing. He looks something like you and me. Those around him believed that wealth and prosperity were signs of God's blessing, so the fact that he had wealth meant that God had laid his blessings upon him. But even with his wealth and status, the man realizes that he lacks something important in his life, that there is something missing that he needs to get. So he has come to the one who has offered sight to the blind and freedom for the demon-possessed. Yet ultimately, he cannot take the risk of the impossible life to which Jesus calls him. He cannot accept Jesus' healing because he does not yet fully see himself as needing to be healed. Because the rich man seems to reject Jesus, this has often been a story of condemnation. A condemnation of all who may love our things just a little too much, which in truth is really most of us. Yet Mark says this, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Matthew and Luke, the other two Gospels that have a version of this story, leave that bit out. But Mark, the shortest of our three Gospels, who is normally very spare with his words, takes the space to note that Jesus loves this man. He doesn't put in a lot of other details, but he puts that in, which tells us that we need to pay attention to what he's saying. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. If we look closely at the Gospel of Mark, we would see that whenever Jesus tells someone to go, it almost always has to do with healing. And it's always tailored exactly to what that particular person needs. To the hemorrhaging woman, he said, your faith makes you well, go in peace and be healed. To to the Gerasene demoniac, he said, go home to your friends and tell them what I've done. To the rich man, he also tells how to be healed. You lack one thing, he said. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. What is the healing that this man needs? This man is possessed, but not by demons like the Gerasene demoniac. He is possessed by his own possessions. Jesus is offering to free him of his possession, to cure him of his excess. But the rich man turns his back grieved. What about you? Do you love your stuff? Do you have more than you will ever need, like a lot of us do? Do you sometimes feel burdened by all of it, upset that you have to clean it or put it away, and yet still find yourself striving for more? If we get rid of it all, will we be closer to God? I think we must ask the same question that the rich man asked, and really all of us do at some point. What can we do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' answer to the man and to us is this, nothing. For mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. To say we must give up all of our possessions in order to be saved puts the burden on us to save ourselves, and we are not capable of that. There is nothing that we can do, ever. 
Neither possessions nor lack of possessions saves us. God saves us. Even Jesus realized he could not save himself. He reminded us that those who think they can save themselves will surely lose their lives. But those who recognize that by their own doing, salvation really is not possible, those who recognize their need will be saved by God, who makes all things possible. The problem with having so much stuff is that it keeps us from realizing our need for God. We use our stuff as a buffer against vulnerability. We use it to fill the emptiness in our souls. We use it to make us feel less susceptible to the ups and downs of life. It makes us feel safe and happy, at least for a little while, and it keeps us from seeing how needy we really are. The rich man's secure status keeps him asking the wrong question. He is always asking, what can I do to inherit eternal life? This was a man accustomed to being able to make things happen. Whatever he wanted, money could buy for him. Jesus' response was the opposite of what he wanted to hear. What Jesus is really telling him as his answer is that there is nothing that he or anyone could do. Jesus advised him to release his wealth and give it to the poor, to get closer to the the fragility of life, to take his own place among those who know that they are needy. In the Gospel of Mark, there is a parade of people whom Jesus treats with special care. The poor, the sick, the demon-possessed, the women, the children. What all of them have in common is that they all know that they are needy. They all knew that they did not have the power to take control of their own lives. They all lived close to the fragility of life. Maybe that made them more likely and more able to respond to Christ. It certainly seems to make them more open to his healing power. In many ways, I think we need to learn to be more like them, like vulnerable children or like those who know they are really sick or like those who know they are in bondage to something beyond their own power. We need to be like them. We need to recognize our own vulnerability and our own deep need in order to really seek and respond to the one who wants to heal us. Now let me just say that none of this is justification to accumulate however much we please and use it however we wish. The witness of scripture is clear regarding our responsibility to take care of the least among us, to be good stewards of what we have, and to be honest and fair in our business dealings. The rampant consumerism in our culture is at odds with the life to which Jesus calls us. And so we, as Jesus' disciples, have to ask ourselves tough questions about how much we need and how much we have, and we have to find a way to live according to the witness of Jesus, allowing his way to govern how much we spend and how much we keep and how much we give away. Our wealth and how we use it absolutely matters, but... Our salvation does not hinge on it. Our salvation hinges on God alone. Nothing else is the essential thing. Not our doctrine, not our denomination, not our determination to live the right kind of life. Not our wealth, not our lack of wealth. None of that saves us. None of it fixes us. None of it heals us. None of it puts us right with God. Only God can do that for us. A Jewish Midrash story says this, The Holy One said, Open for me a door as big as a needle's eye, and I will open for you a door through which may enter tents and camels. In other words, God only needs us to open the door of our hearts just the tiniest crack. The size of the eye of a needle is enough, and God will come pouring in to set up room for an oasis. What must we do to inherit eternal life? Nothing. Not one thing. There is nothing you can do, nothing I can do, to save ourselves or fix our lives or heal our hearts. The only thing we need is to realize our need and to open our hearts to God. I think the hardest news that Jesus has is also the best news he can give us. Our salvation is impossible but not for God. For God, all things are possible. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.